It is a great pleasure to be here with you today and welcome our guest. Uh, we are I exactly, uh, nearly exactly a year uh, away from the presidential uh, election of 2020. We are meeting for this uh, round table in a time of extraordinary political tension in the US and extreme polarization of American society and politics when on both sides of the political spectrum, the storytelling is such that covering the same, s the same subject, one has the eerie feeling of being in two different countries and different stories. The impeachment inquiry into the president's wrongdoings led by the democratic congressional leadership is nevertheless proceeding speedily and has established that Donald Trump did use the lever of <laughs> of military help and political pressure to try to push the Ukrainian president into opening an investigation into his political opponent, Joe Biden. But it also appears nearly undeniable that the Republican Senate majority will consider that these findings don't deserve an impeachment of the president. What then will be the impact of this episode on the presidential campaign? Will it help the Democrats or Trump? Clearly, the answer to this question is very different when whether you speak to the Republicans or to the Democrats. The importance of getting the right picture is all the more crucial and difficult. So to try to make sense of what's going on, we have here three great panelists with us today that I want to welcome. So, uh, good morning, John Zogby. Who, uh, who is uh, coming from the US and is a very famous poster uh, at John Zogby Strategies, very well known for his thorough studies of American public opinion and considered to be the best predictor of presidential elections. <laughs> <laughs> Second panelist, Sébastien Moore, who is Associate Professor of American Studies at l'Université de Lorraine à Metz and an expert on a very key topic, that is the relationship between media and politics, a very crucial topic these days. My third panelist is my colleague Adam Nossiter, US Bureau Chief of the New York Times in Paris. Adam has spent years covering foreign affairs, but he's also spent many years covering American politics, especially in the South. So, the, t the, the theme of our roundtable is the 2020 campaign and the presidential election. It's, it's uh, framed one more year or five more years. So we'll start from John, who will give an overview of US public opinion at this very time. Please, John, tell us what the Americans think of the impeachment procedure and to what extent Trump stands firmly or not. Well, thank you very much for the very nice uh, introduction and for the invitation back. You're my third time, and I always feel welcome by IFRI. <laughs> so the United States had one presidential impeachment in the first 187 years of its existence, and there have been three efforts at impeachment within the last 48 years. It's very stunning, and it is a symptom of a number of problems uh, in the U.S. that I'm going to get into. But let's uh, move right into public opinion, which is very important. And, and that is that uh, before the very well-publicized hearings, uh, so uh, two weeks ago or so, uh, led by uh, Congressman uh, Adam Schiff, sentiment uh, for impeachment, for the indictment of the president to bring him to trial, Sentiment was in the 50 to 54 percent range, positive, and 42 to 44 percent against impeachment. The proceedings, the investigation, were televised for more than a week, and after all of that hoopla, it's very important to understand that sentiment almost changed completely so that now those who are in uh, favor of impeachment are now in the 43 to 45 percent range 
uh, whereas those who um, oppose impeachment are in the 45 to 48 percent range. Let's just say that is margin of error stuff, period. It's enough to suggest really that the needle hadn't moved. And why is that? Number one, the polls show that, two polls now, show that 81 percent of Americans say that their minds have been made up actually for a long time and that they are not at all likely to change their point of view. That leaves just one in five then who are frankly undecided and we need to understand that that one in five are not watching the hearings, not particularly paying attention and as a pollster I need to explain this to you, they are not ignorant. They are people who have to get the kids to school on time, have to keep a job or two jobs, have other things that preoccupy their lives as they should. They don't eat, sleep, or drink impeachment. And quite frankly, the, the uh, level of confidence that they have in government institutions and political parties, and for that matter, a myriad of other institutions like the church and not-for-profits and so on are at a low point. And so, I hope that's, okay. that must be Gallup calling. Um, <laughs> they just have no sense. Um, what's very important as well to note is that the president maintains a 42 to 45 percent job approval rating. And that means you cannot remove a president with a 42 to 45 percent job approval rating unless you want all hell to break loose. For reasons of context, Richard Nixon was about to be impeached and his polls were at 23 percent approval. And for those of you who may remember, those of you who don't remember, it was at that point that the Republican, his party, his leadership in the House and the Senate walked from the Congress to the White House and said, Mr. President, you do not have your political base anymore. And frankly, that's what Nixon said to the American people. He didn't say, I made moral errors, I acted illegally. He said, I've lost my political base. When Bill Clinton was impeached, his approval numbers were at 60 percent. You don't impeach a president who has that kind of support. Uh, and so my view before I move on, because I want to talk about the election as well, um, my view on this is that it's not conspiratorial. The, 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 no one set a trap for the Democrats, but they have fallen into a trap. Uh, b by pursuing impeachment. It's not on the public agenda as much as it's on the agenda in Washington, D.C. That's important to know. And secondly, Donald Trump is an anti-establishment, anti-elite president with a solid political base. And he is motivated, in fact, let's say he thrives when he's Donald Trump the victim. And this allows then for one year of Donald Trump to be the victim and to per keep persuading and feeding red meat to that base that does not trust the elite establishment who these days are perceived as the Democratic Party. So let's move on to the election if I could. I I mean, just, you know, comment on what you just said and, and let you continue. You're telling us in a way that this impeachment uh, uh, maybe hasn't had much impact, actually, on, on, the, on the results and on the mood that you're going to describe now. It has not. It has not. <coughs> we ask the American people, what, what are the top issues? And they will tell you it's health care and the economy, and then driven by voters under 40 and then the younger that voters are, it is climate change and immigration and impeachment. 
is not an issue simply because both parties now have had uh, over a generation worth of experience at delegitimizing each other's elections. We've never been here before in this kind of context. I remember doing focus groups and reading about Wall Street Journal's focus groups where people in the Midwest would refer to President Clinton as Bill. And the focus group moderator, Peter Hart, one of my colleagues, would say, why are you referring to him as Bill? He's not my president. And then in the election of 2000, we were polling for Reuters, and everyone remembers Gore versus Bush. That was a tie. And so three weeks after that election, which had not been resolved at this point, right before Thanksgiving, we asked those who voted for Al Gore, if uh, George W. Bush becomes president, is he the legitimate president of the United States? 57% said yes, and 21% said no. We asked those who voted for Bush, what if Gore becomes president? 67% said he is not the legitimate president of the United States. So we've had a generation now of dealing with this. So in this context now, we have an election. Make no mistake about it. Seven, eight months ago, this was the Democrats' election to lose. They went in with demographic advantages, issue advantages. They were riding high on, on health care and historical advantages, meaning six of the last seven elections, they could count on 242 of 270 electoral votes just by showing up. At this point in time, none of those advantages exist today, and here is what we're seeing really quickly. While 57 percent six months ago said they will not vote for Donald Trump, that is now 46 to 48 percent who will not vote for Donald Trump. Will Donald Trump be reelected? 55% say yes, he will be reelected. That expectation can drive reality. <laughs> on health care, Democrats, uh, I'm only responding to polling. Democrats have lost the advantage on health care, which they had held by 10 points over Republicans by moving towards Medicare for all, but not being able to explain the details. If you have existing coverage, can you keep it? That troubled some people. Who's gonna pay for it? I think both Senators Warren and, uh, and um, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, let me be blunt, blew it on that. And then perhaps most troubling for Democrats, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here, is that the demographic advantage had been such that if they were able to bring out the same numbers of younger voters that Barack Obama had been able to, to bring out to vote, they would have been assured, m maybe still uh, assured, of winning the presidency and triumphing uh, in, the, in the United States Senate. We're starting to see approval ratings of Donald Trump among African Americans reach 25 to 27 percent. You know, normally it's 9 or 10 percent. Uh, among young people, we're seeing Donald Trump's numbers going up. Not winning among young people, but going up. Enough to cut in to that built-in advantage that Democrats had enjoyed. Now, does this mean that many will vote for Trump? the 27% or the rise among younger voters? No, but it could mean that they decide, you know, maybe I just don't want to change the captain of the ship. I'm working, and I wasn't working before. I'm on a path that I wasn't on before. And we could then have a replay of what happened in 2016 where some of those key groups uh, stayed home. Thank you. Thank you, John. This is, <laughs> I would say, tremendously interesting. Uh, a little sobering. Too. When you, sobering when you see it from Paris, because I think uh, uh, people here, you know, following the um, the the the, uh, the events, uh, would tend to think that uh, 
uh, uh, Donald Trump is actually uh, in trouble and uh, uh, that you know the, the Democrats are somehow having the advantage and you're telling us that it's, it's the opposite. So I find it uh, very, very interesting and we will come back of course to the question of the black vote and to other things that you, um, you mentioned. But I would like to turn to, um, to Sebastian Moore and uh, ask him um, to what extent um, this situation and this uh, sort of battle of uh, information, I mean, th this whole political fight is actually also a, 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 a political um, media battle. And uh, to what extent, how are conservative media covering this period of the Trump's presidency? Thank you. All right, I'm going to try to make everything fit in the 10 minutes. Um, academics like to talk a lot, so please um, interrupt me when, when you feel that it's necessary. So I would like to, um, to discuss conservative media support to, uh, to Donald Trump by um, looking briefly at uh, how conservative uh, media have uh, rallied or rallied Trump uh, in uh, the 2016 uh, campaign, and um, then moving on to um, the, the, the current situation and the uh, impeachment crisis. So um, the deregulation of the media sector in the 1980s and 1990s unleashed the expression of partisan discourse in the media in an unprecedented fashion, giving free reign to strongly opinionated news and talk programming on the radio and television. Since then, conservative talk radio programs such as uh, the Rush Limbaugh Show and Fox News primetime talk shows have been natural allies of the Republican Party and Republican candidates. From the early 1990s to Trump's entry in the race for the Republican nomination, hosts of conservative news or talk programs, and particularly conservative talk radio hosts, operated as willful but autonomous supporters of the Grand Old Party. They worked in tandem with Republican officials when they deemed it consistent with their own views and interests, but without ever being subservient to them or accepting to be instrumentalized. Their relationship with the Republican elite was sealed through uh, uh, different uh, elements and, and uh, among them were um, on the phone or in studio interviews, courtesy phone call, official invitations, and so on and so forth. But most of all, conservative media at the time did not so much operate as heralds of the Republican Party as they positioned themselves as the keepers of the canons of modern conservatism and the custodians of the Reagan narrative, holding Republican elected officials accountable and vetting Republican uh, candidates for, for office. In fact, up until Donald Trump announced that he was running for president, the ecosystem of conservative news media operated more or less as watchdogs of the Republican coalition, protecting the ideological purity of the party. What we are witnessing in the current era is conservative news media outlets' systematic and unconditional support to Trump and also the integration of its most emblematic representative, the Fox News Channel, in the operation of the executive. executive. So beyond Rush Limbaugh, and contrary to what is often assumed, Trump's early supporter among the conservative news media was not Fox News. In fact, between Trump, the moment when Trump announced his candidacy and his official nomination as the Republican candidate, Fox staked out a rather ambivalent position with respect to Trump. Primetime talk show hosts were enthused by his candidacy, but the network's management, and most notably Murdoch, had serious misgivings about Trump. Such reluctance to fully endorse Trump provided plenty of space for other media to become Trump's stalwarts, chief among which were far-right news website Breitbart, the news channel One American News Network, and local broadcast television network Sinclair Broadcasting. Founded in 2007 as a conservative pro-Israel news website, Breitbart established itself as one of the most prominent online news sources through its sensationalist approach to information and abrasive style, its unapologetic anti-immigration stance, and its overt hostility towards any form of elite or establishment. 
Steve Bannon took over from uh, Breitbart in 2012, and at that moment, the site started adopting positions more consistent with uh, the alt-right movement, starting in uh, 2017. Fox's skirmishes with the Trump campaign in the late 2015, early 2016, provided Bannon with an opportunity to position Breitbart as the number one forum for Trump ideas, a strategy that proved highly successful as Breitbart was the most cited news source on Trump's official campaign site. One American News Network, well, was a conservative cable news network launched in 2013 to represent views that were deemed too radical for Fox and to broaden the conservative base. The network rallied Trump the moment he declared his candidacy. The network provides information that is a blend of conspiracy theories, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and attacks against Obama and the Democrats. When Trump became president, the coverage became systematically favorable to the administration. It was also on one American news network that conservative commentator and Trump stalwart Tommy Lauren started her career in 2014. Other household names include Lise Wheeler and Graham uh, Ledger, the two stars of uh, the network. A network uh, reached by 35 million households compared to Fox's 96 million one American news network is in no position to seriously challenge the historical conservative channel, but it is powerful enough to affect its competitors' editorial line, particularly when Fox's support to Trump appears to be weakening. And that's um, one of Trump's uh, tweet about uh, the network. Since June 2015, the network has been quoted no less than 34 times in Trump's tweet, a sizable number of mentions for a network that is unknown from uh, the general public. Sinclair Broadcasting, now, um, a network that comprises 191 local affiliates, is present in 89 of the 210 TV markets, um, is another strong ally of the president and is, is in his administration. When um, Sinclair was eager to be recognized as a legitimate pro-Trump role player, he struck I mean, the, the, the network struck a deal with the incoming administration in December 2016, whereby it committed to airing the president's statements and press briefings without interruptions or comments in exchange for greater access to the White House. Sinclair met headlines in April 2018 when it forced its affiliates um, to uh, read a scripted segment denouncing the mainstream news media's hostility uh, to uh, Donald Trump. Among the 38% uh, per of U.S. households whose local TV station is a Sinclair affiliate, um, those can watch uh, the bottom line with uh, Boris Epstein, um, someone who worked as White House Assistant Director for Communication Operations between January and April 2017. Now let me move on to uh, Fox more uh, specifically. Despite Murdoch's uh, proximity with Trump during the 1970s, the management at Fox tended to be suspicious of Trump initially. Murdoch considered him too unpredictable and his xenophobia too blatant for the network to throw its support behind him. For instance, as you can see, Murdoch reacted strongly um, when um, uh, Trump uh, made a, a very despicable statement on Mexican immigrants. The turning point happened in summer of 2016 when Bill Shine was uh, replaced at the head of Fox after uh, Roger Isles was fired. Shine initiated a rapprochement with Trump and Fox and uh, the channel started embracing the Trump agenda more systematically by co-opting uh, some of Breitbart's uh, key themes. Fox became Trump television, in my view, through the Breitbartization of its programs, particularly of its morning and primetime talk shows, which define the Fox identity. In fact, while Fox is undoubtedly Trump's most effective ally in the conservative media ecosystem, there are differences uh, across uh, different types of programs. News anchors, such as Shepard Smith or Brett Baer, tend to be critical supporters of Trump, as opposed to the host of Fox and Friends or the primetime talk show hosts like Hannity, Ingram, Tucker Carlson, or, or uh, Judge Janine. 
I will not go into details about um, the relationship between um, Fox and, um, and um, the Trump White House. I will move uh, rapidly to what um, they do for, uh, for Trump. So what do they do for, uh, for him? Fox's role as Trump supporter implies shielding the president from attacks and criticism by providing audiences with material and interpretative frameworks necessary to counter dominant narratives, critical or hostile <coughs> to Trump. And the most significant of it is the narrative that it was actually Ukraine who interfe that interfered in the 2016 election and not Russia. It equips audiences with the tools to preemptively rebut, rebut accusations and inoculate them against the possibility to accept the validity of evidence disproving Trump and his Republican supporter. Above all, Fox talk show hosts endeavor to depict the president as a winner, regardless of the situation he finds himself in. As Fox audience and Trump's electoral base overlap, the network's ratings and commercial success are contingent upon making Trump appear successful. <coughs> Closing ranks with the administration and congressional Republicans in the context of the impeachment proceedings, Fox News talk show hosts have deployed a multi-pronged strategy designed to exonerate the president of any wrongdoing. And this will be my final point. <coughs> Central to this strategy are systemic attempts at discrediting witnesses and impugning their character, denouncing the procedure as, a work, as the work of the forces conspiring to overthrow the presidency, describing public hearings as tedious, and most of all, turning the tables on Democrats by pushing the idea that the proceedings are devastating for the majority in the House and not for the president. Beyond Fox, other conservative media have been hard at work hunting down the whistleblower to make its identity public, an effort that was uh, spearheaded by One American uh, News Network. So to conclude, as impeachment proceedings are drawing to a close, a likely trial in the Senate is looming into view and the Democratic season is about to start, Trump can rely on the unswerving support of the overwhelming majority of conservative news media. However, support is not completely unanimous, and some cracks are visible. At Fox, moderate voices, critical of Trump, such as Chris Wallace or Andrew Napolitano, are trying to strike a different note, but have increasingly been marginalized. The same holds true at the level of the whole conservative media ecology, where there are, are very few dissonant voices. As an example, aside from conservative news uh, website Drudge Report, which has posted links to pro-impeachment pages, the entire ecosystem seems to have ra rallied uh, Trump as he's approaching um, the, uh, the election and uh, the trial in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, listening to you, I couldn't uh, help thinking that, you know, what you describe in the conservative media is actually somehow the... Um, sort of reflection of the way uh, Trump very successfully hijacked the, cons the Republican Party. And, you know, if he's being so, uh, you know, fully supported, it's he's actually changing, uh, you know, the definition of, of the Republican Party uh, in, uh, of conservatism. Uh, <coughs> I, I want to turn to, um, to Adam and uh, ask him if... Uh, you know, in this uh, this uh, incredible uh, time wh where, uh, as uh, Sebastian just said, uh, you know, conservative uh, Fox uh, media, Fox News, uh, tend to um, <coughs> present Trump always as a winner, and uh, CNN tends to portray him always as a as a loser and and a, and, a, and a dangerous uh, um, leader. Uh, is there still a uh, space for, uh, I would say, normal journalism in the U.S.? And um, how, uh, more personally, I, I, I would be curious to, to have your, your opinion from, from, from this side of the Atlantic when you watch, you know, uh, politics in your home country. 
what is, according to you, specific about what's going on? Is it is it new? Do you see continuities with the past? That actually, uh, John uh, underlined that you know this process of delegitimization has been going on for quite a while in America. Or do you believe that the current political moment is a very specific one? <coughs> Thank you very much for having me here. Um, before I respond to those excellent questions, Laura, I'd just like to go back uh, for a second to something that John said. Um, I think it's more interesting to uh, go further back in time uh, in regard to public opinion on impeachment than to simply uh, look at the snapshot right now. Uh, if you'll recall, um, m some months ago, uh, public sentiment against any sort of impeachment proceeding was quite negative. Um, that changed, and it changed uh, in a positive sense for the Democrats, uh, in the sense that, as John pointed out, uh, opinion is now fairly evenly divided. In other words, it's gone up. Support for impeachment uh, among the electorate has gone up, and it has not been the disaster uh, for Democrats, at least in polling terms, uh, that was predicted. It's, it is, as John said, about a wash now. Uh, but if you look, again, if you put that in, in context and in perspective, uh, that's, that's a plus for Democrats. Uh, also, um, it, is, it is true uh, that Trump uh, maintains um, a lead uh, against some of his possible Democratic opponents. Uh, including Elizabeth Warren in the key battleground states. However, in the six key battleground states that uh, determined the 2016 election, uh, Biden still leads him. So Trump, Trump is not out of the woods in those states, although uh, it's true that Warren um, is a significantly weaker opponent. Uh, it's, also, it's also important, I think, to remember uh, that Trump could uh, do uh, again what he did in 2016, which is uh, uh, win the Electoral College but lose the popular vote. And he could, in fact, do that uh, in more important numbers uh, than he did in 2016. Trump is a minority president, uh, and um, he could remain a minority president uh, simply because of the, uh, of the way our peculiar system works. Um, now, uh, to, to, get to, um, to get to Law's questions, um, is it possible to, uh, to be uh, an independent, uh, fact-finding, truthful uh, media in the American context of today? Uh, obviously, um, I have a somewhat biased view of this, uh, since I think that uh, generally the institution that I work for uh, does try to pursue those goals. Of course, um, the Fox News partisans uh, have a different view of things. Um, so I can only speak from my experience, which is that you know, my colleagues um, uh, do have a point of view, uh, but I think that they're, they are more dedicated uh, to uh, pursuing facts. Um, and um, that's, that's the ultimate standard. Uh, they put facts in the newspaper, um, and if the facts happen to lead in a certain direction, then, then so be it. Um, I, I find a different dynamic uh, with F Fox News uh, in the sense that um, uh, Fox News, and I, here I can, I can only sort of uh, bring it back to a, to a personal experience. Uh, my father-in-law in Mississippi, uh, a very red state, uh, has Fox News on all the time. Uh, or he did when he was uh, still alive. He's now deceased, unfortunately. He had Fox News on uh, from the minute he woke up until he went to sleep at night. And what I found striking about this is that instead of uh, engaging in dialogue uh, as a result of this uh, inebriation with Fox News, he would simply repeat um, the talking points that had come at him all day long 
uh, from that one source of news. So I, and I don't think that that experience is, is unusual. Um, and for him, of course, Fox News was the sole source of news, the only thing that he trusted. Everything else was the lying liberal media, including uh, the organization I happen to work for. Um, and I, I find a different dynamic with um, the people who, in increasing numbers, I might add, uh, read my publication. Um, so, uh, so that's an, a muddled and ambiguous answer to your question. Um, but then, then your other your other point is this: is what's happening now uh, somehow outside the norm of American uh, history and politics? Um, Law mentioned that I covered the South for many years. I did that. Uh, I covered the South for uh, 20 years uh, for various publications, including the New York Times. I lived in the South. My in-laws are all Southern. This is the most conservative part of the country. I was based in Alabama for many years, in Louisiana. I covered Mississippi. Um, so that, that tended to give me, I think, a rather long perspective on American history and politics. Uh, and what I found in the South over those many years of covering it, writing about it, writing a book about it, um, is that um, certain fundamental issues that had come up in the 19th century, for instance, uh, had not gone away. Um, uh, questions about the role of the state, questions about uh, authority, uh, questions about relations between the races. Um, somewhat to my surprise over the course of my career in the South, I found that these issues had not been resolved. Um, even questions about democracy and the, the meaning of democracy. So I think that uh, what we're seeing now, which I believe is a very fundamental and important moment in American history, when again, uh, questions of, uh, of democracy and authority are being decided, um, I think that in the long course of American history, uh, we've seen these questions come up before. Um, we don't know how it's going to turn out this time. Uh, in the past, fortunately for us, uh, it's turned out well because I do believe America has a remarkable capacity to remake itself and reimagine itself. Uh, one can only hope that that process uh, will take place now, but we don't, we don't know. Uh, in any case, I think it is, it is a very important moment for American democracy right now uh, when fundamental questions about um, the nature of authority and um, the nature of executive power are being decided. Uh, so we're just going to have to see how it turns out. Thank you for this uh, very stimulating uh, uh, train of thought. Um, I would like actually to come back from the, uh, uh, you know, following up on what you say about the importance of the question of democracy in this election. I wanted to come back to the question of impeachment and, and turn back to John and ask him whether in your uh, opinion polls you see the idea that uh, in fact this impeachment procedure is not being supported so much because people actually want this uh, um, question of, uh, of Trump's success of, uh, uh, to be solved in a political fight and not in an impeachment procedure. I in other way, in, in other words, uh, they want uh, a, a real presidential uh, you know, contest and not something being played out in Congress. I'm glad you asked that because it's complicated. Uh, the Democrats, you know, there have been points, you know, well, let me back up. Democrats have always had this almost 50-50 split between progressives uh, on the left and uh, moderate establishment on the right. And it has gotten the party in trouble over the years. It is the principal reason why Jimmy Carter lost, uh, Lyndon Johnson decided not to run. We can do that, that entire litany. But it has gotten very volatile within the party. And 
the Democrats have not resolved the heart and soul issue of who, who the party is and what it should be. And there is actually going on, for those who are active in Iowa and New Hampshire and are watching the goings on of the, the Democratic National Committee in DC, this is actually a pretty volatile uh, uh, battle, pitched battle within the party itself. So much so that we may be in a situation again where if it is a moderate Democrat who wins the nomination, even if Bernie Sanders were to come out and say, I endorse Joe Biden or wh whomever, I don't think he can bring his followers with him. And I think vice versa. I think if, if, you know, if it's an Elizabeth Warren or especially a, a Bernie Sanders, I don't know that the party establishment you know, would rally behind them. And we've seen this before. George McGovern, for example, uh, Walter Mondale, I mean, some of the worst defeats the Democrats have had. Where are we at today? Democrats tell us in the polls the most important thing for them is to defeat Donald Trump. And, but that's where the unanimity ends because each side has its own idea of what it will take to defeat Donald Trump. The establishment will say, let's not go too far, let's steady the, sh the ship, let's elect a moderate with some experience who can build bridges, and the left will say, look, we gotta stand for something. We can't be Republican light here. We have to push the envelope on health care, push the envelope on, on global warming and so on. And I don't know that that's going to be resolved. I think this battle is gonna take place right on up to the Democratic National Convention. I think, here's what I know about Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg would not run unless he is absolutely convinced that he will win. Not that he can win. Mike's not a risk taker. He took on Dow Jones and Reuters and triumphed. When he decided that he wa wanted to run for mayor, he asked me to poll for him. And I came back, I was the guy who said to him, this is 1999, Mike, I don't see it. I just don't know. That's why I never got called back again by Mike Bloomberg. He had already decided, he already knew he was gonna win, and things really kind of fell into place. What I'm getting at here is he is running with the blessing of big donors uh, because they don't feel that Biden can win and they know that uh, the progressives would, would lead the path uh, down to a McGovern kind of, uh, of, of defeat. Somewhere in there is the answer to your question, maybe. That's <laughs> very interesting, but what do you, uh, the polling uh, tell you? That's what interests me, because the big donors have their agenda. Uh, but we saw, you know, in 2016 that the, uh, the, the agenda of the American people was rebellion. And uh, what I'm asking you is, do you feel that the agenda at this moment, and do you see coming from your polls uh, that the agenda is still some kind of re rebellion, uh, whether it is on the left or on the right. So let's add up the support in the most recent polls that Biden, oops, let's add up the, the recent polls, the Bidens, the Klobuchar's, the you know, Kamala Harris and so on, the Cory Booker's, the moderates, and then the left, the Sanders and, and Warren, and what we see is, is the party's bifurcated. It is split. So that issue has, in itself, has not been um, resolved. Now, in terms of uh, who is the front runner, if you go by the national polling, it's, it's still Biden who is the front runner. But if you go now into Iowa, and now New Hampshire, interestingly, it's, it's Pete Buttigieg. Uh, I am watching any number of candidates. I'll tell you who's intriguing me to, to watch. Obviously, Bloomberg. Let's set a date, December 12th. If Mike Bloomberg is at 15, 16% in the polls, he's in the mix. He's a very serious candidate. He's already booked 
a total of $58 million in advertising. It shows you what you can, America's a great country. If you've got a dream and a billion dollars of your own money to spend, it's amazing what you can achieve, you know? Um, I'm watching Amy Klobuchar because I wonder if Elizabeth Warren has peaked. I'm starting to see her numbers, I think, predictably go down. And I'm watching young Pete Buttigieg, who is riding high, but I fear for him he may be peaking too soon. They're just starting the attacks on him now. And of course, he has no support among African Americans. None, zero, I mean, literally zero, okay? Uh, I'm also watching, um, I'm watching Amy Klobuchar, as I said, I'm watching Andrew Yang. Not because he's gonna win the nomination, but every vote that he and Tulsi Gabbard get is a vote away from Bernie Sanders. So this is, we're standing on tectonic plates here right now with less than two months to go. We honestly don't know what's gonna happen. I guess I better just shut it up. <laughs> well, I'm gonna turn to Sebastian. Sebastian, how do you see this uh, you know, battle uh, uh, on the Democratic side? Do you believe you know, the uh, election is going to favor center or the uh, you know populist leftist uh, agenda how do you see it i don't i will say that i i don't know <laughs> um i i think to to john john's point um I'm, I'm wondering if it's just a question of moderates on the one side versus centrists um sorry versus progressives on the other side or if it's more a matter of of the degree to which these candidates have taken stock of what has been happening, what we're witnessing right now. Um, I, I think that on the one side you have uh, Sanders and Warren who uh, are seem to be more aware that Trump is just not um, a fleeting phenomenon, but is the symptom of much more deeply entrenched systemic pathologies of US society and, and democracy. And that in, in a way, um, Going back to the pre-Trump status quo, the way that um, Biden might be advocating is is probably uh, not 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 the way to go. So I wouldn't um, make any any p prediction. Um, I think 16 years ago at this time we we thought that Howard Dean was about to uh, secure uh, the, the nomination, but I think it's more a question of of. Um, are you in favor of, of o overhauling the, the, the system and bringing about systemic changes to um, to a, a political and, and social system that that is uh, that is um, uh, beleaguered with uh, a series of illnesses of which the Democrats are partially responsible, or are you advocating a return to the status quo and considering that Trump is just you know a, a something that 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 will pass? I'm I'm surprised that. Um, Biden w is is seem to be trying to make the election a referendum on Trump, uh, the the way it happened in 2016. I don't know if you saw the the, the, the political ad that he ran yesterday, where he uh, uh, featured um, head of state heads of state making fun of of, of Trump. It doesn't seem to be a, a really uh, a smart strategy if you want to uh, go after the, the 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 people who voted for Obama in 2012 and and switch to. Uh, to, uh, to Trump in 2016 and who probably do not have that kind of uh, worldview. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I was, uh, I, th I tend uh, personally to agree for what it means, you know, to agree that uh, this kind of ad is, is not gonna be very efficient. I, I don't find it convincing at all. And I'm wondering, uh, and I want to turn to Adam, whether the, um, the mood actually in the US and beyond actually is not a mix of, uh, um, I would say, quite revolutionary agenda in economics, I would say a populist one that has echoes in Trump's approach, you know, the protectionism, what is going on also in conservative circles where they are rethinking, you know, the free, the, the f uh, free market agenda, I mean, I think it's striking that both on the left and on the right, you have now some kind of e economic populism going on. 
uh, with a mix of more conservative social, I would say, cultural agenda. Is it is it where you know the the uh, the wind is blowing? And do you see anyone uh, in the democratic uh, you know uh, camp uh, able to, uh, to 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 actually uh, take take over these two themes? Um, yes, I, I do see people in the Democratic camp who um, who are espousing uh, what's commonly taken as a populist agenda. Whether that's uh, a winner in 2020 um, is another question entirely. Um, but I do think that um, there is uh, in the U.S. Uh, generalized concern over uh, inequality. Um, I think that there is a great deal of anxiety uh, about uh, issues like student debt. Um, and so I think that um, the candidate who can, you know, skillfully um, uh, harness those issues um, while, you know, appearing centrist uh, on, on the cultural ones um, has, has an opening. Um, I, th I do think, I mean, the, the Democrats, as always, are uh, shaking their, their heads and, 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 and rubbing their hands and worrying about, about the perfect candidate. Um, the, the miraculous thing about our primary system is that it winnows out um, the candidates who, who cannot um, command uh, you know, a substantial portion of the electorate. So, um, uh, as an observer, I, I don't think it's it's I think it's too early. The, the 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 winnowing out process of the of the primaries has not even begun, and the the degree to which these um, populist sort of issues uh, are going to figure in the election um, is not completely clear. Um, I think there are a few dynamics that are that are quite clear. One one of them, of course. Uh, is the extremely solid support that Trump has among his own electorate, 90 percent. Uh, and the other is the uh, intense uh, anger uh, the Democrats have for uh, uh, have against Donald Trump. So uh, those those are two constants. Um, for the rest, um, it's it's to be decided. Um, you know. Uh, whether or not the populist uh, agenda um, that we've seen in, in, in some European countries uh, uh, gets into the saddle, I don't think so. I think that, um, in fact, I think that, that that's globally on the retreat, uh, if, I, if I had to take a stand on that. I mean, Salvini, Orban, uh, uh, these have all, these are people, even Boris Johnson, these have all people who have suffered hits. Um, uh, people have discovered that uh, populism doesn't work that well in practice. Uh, and in the U.S., um, you know, Bloomberg's uh, support uh, is, is minimal right now. I don't see a big demand for another billionaire in the race. There, Bloomberg, Bloomberg is nowhere in the polls. Um, of course, that could, that could change. Um, and then, you know, there has been a stock market boom, and some people love Trump for that. Um, but um, as the Financial Times pointed out yesterday, two-thirds of Americans haven't benefited at all from it. So, um, you know, people are conscious of these sorts of things, and I think that will factor in. Thank you. Um, I, I think that the, uh, I mean, all what, uh, that we've been saying and, and uh, listening to you is that actually Trump remains very strong. And one of the reasons, it seems to me, John, is that Trump has on the one side has the economy going for him, that's what uh, Adam just said, and he has captured the imagination of extremely important segment of the American electorate during 2016. But we don't see anyone, ac aside I would say from Bernie Sanders in a way, capturing the um, imagination of the American people on the, the Democratic side. You, know, you have programs, you have candidates, but you don't have a phenomenon like Trump, so it's going to be very difficult. Uh, I, I'm saying about uh, aside from Sir Sandy Bernie Sanders, who have other problems, to actually compete with him. And I, I wanted to 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 go 
uh, to the question that you mentioned that I find extremely interesting, which is the question of the black vote. Because you mentioned that um, in your polls, about 25 to 27 percent of, of the black uh, people would consider voting for Donald Trump. And I, f I find it absolutely, you know, a, a very important element that could actually, uh, you know, decide the election, really, because traditionally, as we know, the black vote, you know, has been actually somehow, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, has been part of the of the democratic, uh, I would say, s solid basis. And I'm wondering whether it's not a, uh, you know, the um, the reflection of the uh, failure of the uh, identity politics model that the Democrats have been defending uh, for years, uh, when you see, for instance, that the, the black people ready to vote for Donald Trump. I've been watching the African American vote uh, for for 50 years. You know, the pattern is, generally speaking, aside from a a local election here or there, uh, that uh, at least 90% of those who turn out among the African Americans vote Democrat. With Barack Obama's case, 93, 94% voted for the Democrat. What's also very important to understand is that Barack Obama was able to increase the slice of the pie. So Typically, African Americans, about 10% of the vote. In 2008, they were 12.9% of, of the vote, a much larger vote, too, and 12.9%. 2012, when he was reelected, they were 13.1%. Doesn't sound high, but if you f think in terms of 93, 94%, every black voter who comes out is voting for Barack Obama. What happened in 2016 is that the black percentage of the vote declined to 11% of the total. That's very, that, that's huge. That's very significant. So here's how I've learned how to read polls. Uh, example, 2016 CBS News did a poll and they published it on Face the Nation on Sunday, and they said, look at the support Hillary Clinton has among African Americans. 81% for Hillary, 8% for Trump, 11% undecided. I said to my wife, holy shit, two days before the election, why are 11% of African Americans undecided? They're not going to vote for Trump. They're not going to vote, and they did not vote. They did not vote in North Carolina. They did not vote in Michigan, in uh, particularly younger white men. So where are we at today? In no way can I envision 25 to 27 percent of African Americans voting for Donald Trump. It is, as you suggest, the candidates have not yet captured their imagination, and they won't capture their imagination unless the party has a cohesive message. And what's that cohesive message? Sebastian, as you've pointed out, being against Donald Trump is not enough. That gets you about the same support that Donald Trump gets among his base. The battle now is now younger African Americans, actually younger voters, period, who, who are going to ask the question that famous political scientist Samuel Popkin has, has asked in his book, The Rational Voter, what have you done for me lately and what will you do for me next? And that's a difficulty if younger African Americans are saying, hey, I'm working. I wasn't before. Hey, I'm on a path. I wasn't before. I'm going to vote for Trump. But it's not a compelling reason to vote for the Dems. Yeah, and uh, I think you, you're totally right. I mean, is the criminal justice reform also playing out for him in some ways? Because, you know, it's, he's <laughs> it's something that the black voters uh, care about. And also, uh, 
isn't there something which has been somehow you know underestimated, which is the flat the fact the black electorate is actually much more conservative in c in questions of uh, in cultural matters than the Democratic Party, which is going on cultural matters more and more to the to the left, you know, further and further. A and actually, the black community is conservative. And if it didn't vote in terms of, uh, you know, qu question of race, which is, uh, uh, you know, traditionally uh, thought to be more, uh, you know, uh, defended on the left, they could actually vote the uh, Republican. Just uh, I, I can ask. I mean, this question yeah. is for uh, all of you, actually. A question I wanted to, to ask you: Do we know anything about the demographics and? socioeconomic status of those who say that they m could be for Trump I would assume that we're talking about the um, this mic is not okay um, the the, the um, upper the, the african-american upper class um, or morally conservative upper class that would respond to uh, the signals uh, regarding mor morality politics and anti his anti-abortion stance and Supreme Court nominations. The gay marriage, because uh, yeah, yeah. we see that uh, Buttigieg has zero percent of uh, support. Mm -hmm. you know, this is quite obvious what it means. You saw how cautious Barack Obama was on the issue of gay marriage. In fact, it was Joe Biden that let the cat out of the bag on supporting gay marriage, and President Obama was furious with him for doing that. But as you recall, not long before Obama came out in support of gay marriage, and Biden uh, you know, had done so a little bit previous to that, California had its Proposition 8, and African Americans voted against legalizing gay marriage in California overwhelmingly. Barack Obama then led on the issue because he saw this is another key element of my base that I need and that, and that needs me. The difficulty is, to, to get to Sebastian's point, um, that where we're at now, focus groups are saying that among older Christian African-American men, and to a lesser degree, but still older Christian African-American women, it's not so much that they're bothered by Pete Buttigieg um, being gay, it's the fact that he is married and talks about a, a spouse. And that is the sort of thing that can chip away. Uh, what you have among younger African Americans is this element of a lack of history with the Democratic Party and that sense that um, I'm being taken advantage of here. Uh, and who is really talking to me and to my community? And frankly, what Biden has going for him is the fact that he was a successful vice president under, you know, Barack and Michelle Obama are the iconic American couple today. And, you know, this is what boosts Biden more than anything else, his linkage to, to the Obamas. And I think also to some degree, the sense that ultimately millennials Gen Z are not asking for a radical agenda. They're asking for, let's, I'll put it in my words, but they're asking for a caretaking and a steady ship for about four years until they are ready uh, to, to lead. I, I can expand on that, but that's enough. Want to say something, uh, Adam? Yeah. Now we need to keep it in perspective. I mean, Trump's approval rating among, among blacks in the polls that I've seen right now is 10%. Uh, that's you know insignificant. And he got, what, 8% of the black vote in um, 2016. So um, that, that's not going to be a factor. Um, on the other side, um, one talks about the potential uh, of mobilizing anger against Trump um, to produce electoral results. Uh, I think if you, you look at the, the two of the most recent elections in the U.S. in Louisiana and Kentucky, Louisiana where I lived for many years, um, the, the Democrats won the governorship in Louisiana, 
despite Trump's vigorous campaigning for the Republican. Uh, and that is attributable largely to a huge uh, black mobilization in Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, and uh, similarly, they won in Kentucky, again, despite Trump's campaigning. And again, um, Kentucky has a significant black population. Uh, and so that was a factor there, too. Also, uh, the legislative elections in Virginia. Um, so I don't think na nationally blacks can't, um, can't really affect an outcome. But um, I think uh, on the level of individual states, certainly they can. Um, you know, I, think, I think this election is going to, again, play out uh, among two key voting groups, white working class men and suburban women. Um, and um, the Democrats uh, won the 2018 midterm elections by a, a really solid nine-point uh, majority, uh, and that, I think, has generally been attributed to um, the distaste of suburban women for Trump. Um, and, then, and then there's the issue of white working-class men um, who, in the... Um, in the battleground states uh, will not vote for Elizabeth Warren, um, but they will vote for Biden. So, um, you know, I, I think um, the issues are going to be, are going to be, the, the key voting groups are going to be somewhat similar to 2016. Thank you, Adam. Uh, yes, do you see, oh, you want to? Uh, I'd like to no. just comment on that. Now, I, as that is very valid. However, let's j also remember, though, that Barack Obama won a majority in 2008 and was walloped in 2010, came back and won a majority in 2012 to get walloped again in 2014. And so while it's very valid to watch the trends from Doug Jones's victory uh, into then uh, 2018, this is, um, we are not resolved, you know, in terms of the, the, the 2020 election. There's still, a lot of dyna dynamics, and I think a lot of them within the Democratic Party itself uh, that, that needs to play out. Yes. Thank you, uh, John. If you uh, uh, see the white uh, working man, uh, working class men actually in the, in the swing states, potentially sw swinging from uh, Trump to, to Biden, because it, I, I'm not sure it's absolutely obvious. And, uh, in relation with uh, to that, what about the immigration issue in this uh, in this uh, political battle? Where does it? It was the absolutely key factor in 2016. Where is it now? How does it play out when the Democrats are actually pushed quite far to the left in terms of their political proposals on immigration? So we've been talking about the 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 white working class male uh, voter, you know, since uh, Ross Perot. Right and been Pat Buchanan back in the in the early '90s, and you know th uh, there is a lot of anger there. There's a lot of status anxiety. They are genuine, genuinely worried about keeping their middle class status and and or passing it on to their children. They are also seeing their white America uh, just float by in in a sea of of, of immigrants and uh, non-whites, uh, and so on. So the f uh, financially losing status, socially uh, losing status, seeing their country no longer the greatest country in the world, and, and Donald Trump has been able to, to actually bottle that and, and to use it. The flip side of that is that Democrats do have a tradition of being very elitist, and of essentially beaming that message you're so stupid, and if you agreed, if you could only be smart, you would agree with our position. Deplorable. It is uh, deplorable. Yeah, that's, that, that was a good one. Um, and the only person I really see bridging that is Uncle Joe from Scranton, um, who genuinely comes from a white ethnic working class background, acts that way, is flawed, like the rest of us, has by and large a good record and a good bonding. And I think one of the things that, I have said this in briefing 
Senate and House Democrats, Senate and House Republicans as well, hearts beat charts. Democrats love to go to the American people and say, facts, 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 trends. And Republicans go with the heart. And I think, honestly, I, I'm not campaigning for Joe Biden. There are not many votes in this room anyway. But I honestly think that he is the one who can, who can conjure up the legacy of the Obamas, bridge the gap with white working class voters, be the transitional guy who can say, all right, I'm 76, 77 years old. Let me steady the ship a little bit, just for a term. And I don't see it in anyone. The only other person I see with that potential is Amy Klobuchar, for all of the same reasons. Um. I'm going to ask you one more question and then turn to, uh, to Sebastian. When you say he's the only one to keep the legacy of the Obamas, but how do you think that the people uh, think of the uh, legacy of the Obamas? What is the legacy of the Obamas, actually? It's under siege is, is what it is, and Democrats are aware of that. Republicans hate Obama, but I don't know if you know this, but in... 2016 exit poll, the same election that went 48 to 46, Hillary to Trump, it was 53 to 42 that said 13 percentage points said that they would vote for Obama for a third term. And so he left on a high note, and they are the iconic couple. They are the most popular Americans today. So within the primaries and then quite possibly the general election in those battleground states, the Obama legacy is, is not going to hurt. The, the Ob Obamacare uh, is riding a crest right now, I think especially since Medicare for All seems to have imploded. You know, six, seven months ago, 70, 73% supported Medicare for All. The devil was in the details. Some thoughts on? Yeah, I'm. I'm still. Um, <coughs> in terms of Trump's weaknesses, um, well, it depends on the perspective that you take. If you take the perspectives of moderate and uh, people who are inclined to be uh, to vote Democratic, he has uh, many weaknesses. But I don't think that his electorate sees it uh, that way. He's been a very uh, B very effective at uh, staying on message, um, being being consistent in uh, um, signaling to uh, to his base. Um, I also think that um, to to John's point earlier, um, that he's Democrats are giving him an opportunity to remain a victim um, until election day is is a very uh, is a is a very powerful uh, a factor. I think it resonates with the kind of siege mentality that uh, his his support base uh, uh, has um, feeling or, or considering themselves as an unduly flouted uh, majority and, and and that it that I think can be extremely uh, uh, powerful as a as a uh, mobilizing tool I, I don't really see a, a I mean at the top of my head something that could be a weakness especially um, if we look at it from the democratic, um, from, from the perspective of uh, the, the obstacles that are on uh, Democrats' pathway to victory and the structural, uh, the structural obstacles such as you know, voter suppression, uh, when, when you know that, that a Democrat has to uh, secure 10% more of the vote in order to, to make up for the, the discrepancy. I, I think it's, a very, um, it's, it's an uphill battle ahead for Democrats if I had to... Um, give you my two cents on it. Thank you. I think this is the general feeling of this, <laughs> of this panel, S but I want to turn to the, uh, to the audience and, and ask you if you have any questions. I see my colleague Philippe Gelli. I'm going to give him the floor. Hi, Philippe Gelli with Le Figaro. Uh, two quick follow-up questions to John. Uh, you told us 81% of the electorate had made up, made up his mind. You didn't tell us how they split. Mm. 
And even split. Even, okay. And about those one in five, what matters to them? What will make their vote the, and the difference? Thank you. You know, that's really interesting because I have not seen any polling numbers that ask where do you lean on impeachment. And s what we do know is that they're not watching the hearings. And so it's really among many or most of the one in five. Um, th it's not a part of uh, who they are or and, and what's important to them. In many ways, uh, the only one issue that, uh, uh, that was tested uh, um, among the 19%, this was in a, a Marist poll, is that it uh, impeachment was not one of the top 10 issues that they identified with. It's kind of interesting. What are, oh yeah, the, the issues, pretty much the same, you know, it's healthcare, it's the, um, the economy, uh, immigration, and then pushed up in particular by uh, voters under 35, so kind of half millennial, half Gen Z, uh, it is climate change. That group is particularly driven by, by climate change and, uh, and inequality. And as Adam pointed out, uh, for, uh, student debt and, or debt comes into play. This is a question for Sebastian and uh, Adam Lasseter. It's about uh, media's influence in this race. How strong can it be uh, when you have a president always calling out for fake news, when you have very biased media such as Fox News, when you have social networks that are sometimes more red than the traditional press? Uh, what, what can be the role of the media and is there any trust left with traditional media today? Um. Yeah, I, I just... Um, I can't answer that question globally. In fact, I, uh, you know, m to talk about the media uh, strikes me as, uh, the media in general strikes me as misleading because uh, it's such a variegated group. Um, I can only, you know, say what goes on in my outfit. Um, and what I think is significant is that we've seen a, a really sharp demand a uh, rise in demand for, for what we do. I mean, uh, over the last um, five, six years, our uh, subscription numbers have doubled. Uh, we're now at um, pretty close to five million. We were around 2.5 uh, before, before Trump took over. Uh, we add 200,000 new subscribers every quarter. Um, so th there's a demand for what we do um, and I think there's also um, a, a hunger for um, uh, a news organization that attempts to simply provide the facts, um, even though, of course, uh, President Trump uh, calls us the enemy of the people. Um, so uh, that's that, that might answer your question. I, I think we, we do have um, an important role to play in the, in the um, upcoming election. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people who are going to be relying on us. Any other questions? Yes, gentleman here from the second row. I yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's it's difficult to speak in terms of the media as as a as a internally consistent entity. Um, the, the the problem is is also uh, the uh, the infinite media offer uh, that is available to people and and the fact that that people can um, actually continually expose th themselves to content that only reinforce reinforces their their own views. So I think the problem is here. The problem is is not that um, this or that media outlet is not doing uh, its job. O over I mean overall the traditional uh, media newspapers of reference are doing an amazing job at reporting the fact, at the facts, pursuing uh, truth. The problem is who do they pursue 
uh, facts for, because usually they tend to uh, to address an audience that is already um, that already agrees or that is uh, already very much on board with uh, with the information that that is presented. So I think the challenge is that that people are in silos, they're in the echo chamber, and this affects the capacity of American people to cultivate shared uh, patterns of representation, and this affects the possibility of, of, of common, common citizenry, and, and if you push uh, uh, it further, it, it, it challenges the very uh, possibility of nationhood when everybody is in their own uh, uh, silos. I think another challenge that, that needs to be um, addressed is um, the phenomenon of news deserts, desert, desert, am I not stressing this right? Desert, and sorry, the disaffection of, yeah, probably so. The, the fact that uh, local newspapers, community newspapers have been disappearing at, at a very uh, uh, strong pace uh, is, is actually uh, terrible for, um, citizens to be informed at a local level um, about what is going on in their communities. And um, this l leaves them with only the national uh, outlets. Um, I talked about Sinclair Broadcasting earlier. What Sinclair is doing is actually purchasing and buying out local TV stations and, um, and transforming the, uh, the, 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 the uh, local offer of news into conservative news, and, and, and uh, this is significantly affects the diversity at the local level. And this is important because local news used to be, uh, and, and still is in some areas, the first uh, news source for people. It's also a way for uh, news of, of local relevance to go up the, uh, the news hierarchy and to, and to uh, uh, percolate up to the, to the national level. So. Th this question is is is, uh, is fundamental, I think. Maybe one or two more questions. Yes, here. Good morning. Uh, so you can present yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Yaron Gamberg, I'm an Israeli diplomat, and also doing research on U.S.-Russia uh, relations. So my question is to Mr. Zobi, but also to other panelists. You've been introduced by uh, Laura Mandeville as a predictor as a predictor of uh, the elections in the United States. I'm not asking you to predict this, but as you've said, in the last seven to eight months, there were dyna dynamics that actually uh, favored, uh, were in favor of Trump, uh, mostly due to mistakes by Democrats. What do you see in the 10 months from now? Uh, what kind of mistakes Trump can make to lose these elections? And, <laughs> and uh, or he, he can just play the uh, victim of this possible impe impossible impeachment that will be is going to happen. Thank you. Do we un provocateur? Anything can happen. Um, y y you know, the the important thing about Donald Trump is that he can bypass traditional channels of media. He can utilize this, but he's got his own direct tweets. Um, but. What could happen, of course, is, is that this robust economy tanks. You know, the, the, you, you look at the, the Dow Jones uh, as, as one example, and, and you say, well, come on, this has got to come crashing. However, he's buoyed just this past week by the chief economist at Goldman, who said the unemployment could go down to 3.25% before the election. That's very compelling. Not a perfect number, but we, but it's the number that we all use. It's the it's the common denominator number that we've we've always used. What could go wrong? Well, I suppose he really could shoot someone in Fifth Avenue, but so far I think that 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 might play. You know, depending on who gets shot, I suppose. Um, no, I I think the selection is being played on Donald Trump's turf, unfortunately. Uh, the master showman that he is, uh, and and that's why I, uh, I I I do think that the House of Representatives has made a, a serious mistake that puts it even further on on his turf. That's not a moral judgment. It's not a legal judgment. Do you want to hear what I would do? 
Yes, of course, we do. Yes, but <laughs> first of all, I the Chris Wallace <laughs> that you you got to get a better one. Uh, uh, I w if I were Nancy Pelosi, and, and I know she held out, and there was too much pressure from the bottom, but I, I would have pushed to censure the president, uh, make a statement about the president's behavior, and say, now we're going to pass a whole series of bills that he will not sign, but this will be how we defeat him. We're going to pass infrastructure. We're going to get a sense of the House of Representatives to get back into the, uh, the, the Paris Climate Change Accord. We're going to pass Barack Obama's executive order on, uh, for uh, Dreamers. Uh, I, would, I would take it away from the president's turf and create our own turf. And of course, that will not happen. Thank you, John. I, I want to now, we, uh, we are actually finishing, it's, it's one o'clock already, so I'm going to just ask to answer yes or no <laughs> uh, to the three participants. I mean, John has in a way already answered, but uh, Adam, is it one, uh, one more year or five more years? Um, looking, at it, looking at it right now, I think Trump will be defeated, but obviously, who knows? Um, five, maybe. As of today, I would say five.